Thank you so much, John, and to Calvin and Habib for in including us in the program this week. So I'm Nina Tandon. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called EpiBone, which had its origins um, years ago uh, in, uh, across, the, across the courtyard in E25. And I'm really excited to share our story with you. OK, so humor me for a moment. <laughs> if everyone could just close their eyes. Close your eyes and scan your body. What are we made of? Bring your attention to your bones, supporting you in your chair. Maybe that'll make some of us sit up a little bit taller. <laughs> we are each made out of 206 bones held together by 360 joints. You can open your eyes, okay. But, um, you know, a, a stitch together all of bones of all different shapes and sizes held together by these, you know, very complex series of bones, of joints. Um, but many of us are actually more than that, um, if, if you'd seen the biomechatronics talks yesterday. <laughs> as we go through this lifetime, this is our motivating fact. Uh, as we go through this lifetime, we are projected, um, many of us, that 75% of us will be living with parts of our bodies that we, will be, we were not born with, if we're not already. Okay, these are the, um, the false teeth we have, the cardiac stents, the hip and knee replacements that we've all started to accumulate. Bone is already the most transplanted human material. Um, you know, we're replacing millions of bones every year, um, for, ranging for cancer, trauma, congenital defects. And we are replacing even more joints every year because of only a couple millimeters of damaged cartilage. Okay, so this is a huge industry. Um, compounding this issue is that as the world is globalizing and populations are aging, we're getting injured earlier and earlier in life. You know, we're getting injured at 15, and many of us are projected to live until 115. And so it's clear that we're going to need our implants to last as long as we do. Medical science over the past 100 years or so has done a great job on the device side of creating a kind of um, spare parts library <laughs> of different shapes and biomaterials that can help, um, uh, help replace tissue that needs to be replaced. And on the cell therapy side, physicians and cell therapy companies have done a great job at developing cell therapies that can help our bodies stimulate endogenous repair. Okay. However, <laughs> astonishingly, we are still replacing parts of our bodies with c bones carved out of our, you know, other parts of our bodies or other people's bodies, or replacing them with ceramic, metal, polymer, and so on. And so we asked ourselves as bioengineers, um, and, and as technologies like digital fabrication were really um, starting to mature, um, is there another way that we can approach this problem? And you know, central to this idea is this is is one that is very familiar to us, but maybe not familiar to everyone. This idea that our bodies are modular. Okay, um, the Human Genome Project opened this up to us. The idea that our genetic material is a code that we could you know cut and paste, and that our cells, which contain this genetic information, nest together and and form or you know. Um, form organs, and that those organs are then nested in our bodies as we, as we form our organ systems and then our, bot, our physicality, okay? And, um, and so in this idea of, you know, for EpiBone, from our perspective, we thought, why not use cells as pixels in this, time, this, type, of, um, this type of system, using digital fabrication and the cells that grew our bodies in the first place and connect to them and help them grow new organs in the lab, new, new, new bones, okay? So these are actually um, human mesenchymal stem cells. These are, this is an image from the laboratory. These are, in many ways, the employees of EpiBone, these adipose-derived stem cells that grow all of the, uh, the bones and cartilage that we grow. Um, by the way, um, these same principles are one that I'm very excited to help um, disseminate as part of the Community Bio Initiative. I'm one of the instructors in David Kong's class, How to Grow Almost Anything. And we've used some of these principles of cells as pixels in um, the, the, the modules that we've developed over the past three years together. For the first two years, we, we made biotic video games using microbes as characters in uh, video games that we, that we made with the students. And this year, for the first time, we taught students from everywhere from from Lima to uh, Japan, how to grow cartilage using cells derived from supermarket chicken. So talk to us if you're interested in hearing about our work with the Community Bio Initiative. Okay. So 
But my day job is at EpiBone, and here's and our mission is this: um, the first, the most important words are the first three: transforming patient lives through skeletal reconstruction. Here's how we do it. If we can turn down the volume. We start from a CT scan from patients from which we can extract the three-dimensional data that forms the defect. We use that three-dimensional data to make a customized scaffold and customized bioreactor that are bespoke per patient defect. We take a small sample of adipose tissue from patients. We extract the stem cells out of them and infuse them into the scaffold contained in our bioreactor. Our bioreactor mimics the conditions of the human body, providing controlled oxygen, temperature, and mechanical forces that help trick those stem cells into um, attaching to the scaffold, proliferating, and differentiating into osteoblasts as they mature that piece of scaffold into living bone. It takes about three weeks. After implantation, um, what we've seen in our animal studies is that the epibone graft and the host, gra the host tissue grow seamlessly together. Vasculature connects, um, and after a period of a couple of months, it's almost indistinguishable from the host tissue. We've been developing this for cartilage as well as combination tissues, osteochondral tissues, which is a combination of bone and cartilage. And we're very excited um, at this juncture to be um, on the cusp of our first human clinical trials. There are many benefits to this type of approach. First, because we use digital fabrication, there's, no, it, there's a perfect fit, perfect puzzle piece shape. Secondly, because it's made from your own cells, there's no risk for rejection. And thirdly, because it's alive, it can continue to remodel and integrate with, our, with all the other bones in our bodies that we were born with. Um, it's very important. We have, a, we have a platform technology. It's very important for us to make sure that we are developing that platform in a focused manner. And so for us, we've started with bones in the head and face, where shape really matters, the current treatment options are really bad, and most importantly, the load-bearing requirements are minimal. From there, we, we plan to address um, volume markets in dental and spine in collaboration with, clinical partner, with, with industry partners. As I mentioned, we're also growing bone in conjunction with cartilage. We're starting with a project in, um, to address defects in the knee, but we've also now received um, Department of Defense grants to help us explore this for aesthetic applications in their Wounded Warrior project. On the, along the way, we're also hoping to address orphan conditions for craniofacial defects in pediatric patients, applying for regenerative medicine, um, advanced therapy designation next year as part of our plans, moving this towards clinic. Our vision, um, and this is just one drop in the bucket, is that is to be part of the one-stop body shop, a living body shop of the future, in which we can use our own cells, which grew our bodies in the first place, to generate replacement parts as we need them. You know, looking ahead, we hope that um, we can start to build on our ability to grow bone and cartilage together and growing other tissues in conjunction with that so that we can think about replacing whole limbs eventually in the future, perfused organs after that. And um, thinking, you know, in the future that the bodies that we were born with don't have to dictate the limits of what we can do. How did we get started? Um, I, I started here at MIT as, a, as, as an EECS student in the lab of Bob Langer with my, my PI, Gordana Vunyak Novakovic. When she later moved to Columbia, I moved with her as her first student, and that's where I met our CSO, Ik Bumaratana, who's here, waving his hand. Um, we're, we're demanding the demo table during the break. When um, we spun out the company many years later, it was very important for us to find someone who could help us shepherd this technology towards the clinic. So we're very happy that Alma Hawkins, who brought the first and second autologous cell therapies, skin and cartilage, to market to guide us as we are now moving towards clinic. Um, our regulatory consultant is Joyce Fry Vaskin Cells. She's the former deputy director of the um, Cell and Gene Therapy Office at the FDA and is helping us see around all those regulatory corners as we move towards clinic. So, this is our clean room. We have a clean room in Brooklyn, New York, which is where, we, where our team of 20 is based. And um, I just want to give you a few highlights of our um, kind of key milestones for the past three and a half years since we spun out of the university. We've successfully implanted 30 pigs and 200 rats with our technology. We have built out a uh, 5,000 square foot state-of-the-art laboratory, including this GMP clean room, which will help us now grow human grafts suitable for human implantation. We've built out a quality team as we've transitioned towards clinic. We've submitted our first regulatory submission last quarter um, towards the F to the FDA. 
and we're awaiting approval. We've, we've raised $11 million to date, including um, you know, from really amazing angel investors like Ratan Tata and Henry Kravis, and now we're moving towards our first institutional round um, to fund our first clinical trial. We're really excited that Cleveland Clinic will be powering our first clinical trial from their face transplant group, and that we've been accepted as a J-Labs company as part of their inaugural class. As part of our work with the Department of Defense Advanced Regenerative Medicine Institute, we're also really happy to be partnering with companies like Medtronic and Honeywell. Um, as I mentioned, we're raising a Series A right now to fund our first clinical trial. Please talk to us during the break if you're interested in learning more. Our goal is to fund our first trial in um, this cranial bone indication and to bring our first two pipeline products to the same stage we are right now with, with bone. It's been so inspiring for us this week to hear about all of the different potential areas of collaboration with member companies and lab labs here. Um, and, you know, especially around the ethos of just knowing that we are part of a much larger story in which when patients become their own source, their own source material for, for therapies, how is the world going to have to adjust around that? The regulatory folks are, are evolving. I think it's, it's really important for us to note that there are many other areas that will need to evolve as disruptive technologies like this start to take root. And so um, we're very excited to, to be collaborating um, with folks as we, as we move ahead. Okay, so I'm kicking off our session um, uh, in, in, in biology. So I just wanted to finish with some final thoughts. Um, it, you know, as we think about the fact that our technologies, as we disrupt, are going to be hitting all of these different um, points of culture and um, and other collaborators, that our values, our, our company values, can be a very important moral compass as we think about how to go into these uncharted waters. So these are our company values around growing, not building, and when we think about regulation, that we want to take the high road because we believe it's the fast road. Okay, so in closing, um, I'd like to invite you to again scan your bodies. Okay, and imagine if by the time we're 115, all of those spare parts that we are bound to have accumulated will be made not out of metal, not out of ceramic, not out of bone cut out of yours or someone else's body, but out of you. <laughs> At EpiBone, we have every intention of making that happen. And if I could kick off the, the, the rest of the, the, the companies in this session I, I, with a provocative idea, it would be, you know, if we've gone from demo or die, to now deploy um, for the groups in this for the, the the startups in this group, I think for us it's really about deploying life. So thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the rest of the sessions.